He's still on his throne. He's in control. No matter what's going on around us these days. That's one thing we need to remember. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for that reminder, Lord, that you still are on your throne. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, that you have given us tonight to come and hear from you, Lord. We ask that you would just settle our hearts tonight, Lord. There's so much going on around the world and in this country right now, Lord God. There's so much happening, Lord. So we want to lift those that are struggling tonight, Lord God. Mr. Phil, Phyllis, Doug, Pete, Bob, those that are struggling, Roxy, those that are struggling, Lord God. In this moment, we ask for your touch, Lord God. We pray that through it all, they will continue to seek you and and find you where they are, Lord. So I pray that you will meet them where they are, Lord God. But we do have a reason to praise, Lord God. You have seen many come through their, their afflictions, Lord God, like Pete and Bob, Lord, that are doing well. We thank you for that, Lord God. We praise you for that, Father. We want to lift all those tonight, Lord God, that are in the path of this hurricane that, that is about to hit Florida, Lord God, that you, you will just be with them, Lord God, that you will ease their fears, Lord God, that we know that you, Lord Jesus, you, the winds and the waves, they obey so we pray tonight, Lord God, that you would just weaken that storm. Weaken that storm, Lord God. And if you choose not to, Lord, we pray that you would just place your head of protection over everyone that is in that path, Lord God. See them through this time. So again, we thank you for this evening, Lord God. We ask that you go before us now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good to see everybody tonight. So uh, tonight we'll be reading from Romans 5. And I will not be doing the whole chapter because, like I did the past few times in the previous chapters, because as I got into this study and I started to read, I was like, wow, there's so much here in just these first few verses. So we'll be reading from verses 1 through 11. And just to recap, Paul opens his letter to the church in Rome, and we see Paul's heart for the church. We see how much he cares for, the, for God's people. And then he jumps right into the bad news that he has for everybody that we're all under wrath, we're all under God's judgment. He makes that clear. But then he gets into the good news. Let's just know that it's about faith, if, if faith alone, faith in Jesus Christ, that we, we could be justified through him in the work he did on the cross. So he, he hunkers down for a couple of chapters and, and just keeps pounding away at faith. I like how Billy Graham says it when he, when he talked about faith. I, I, I watched a sermon from him some time ago, and, and he says, there's a lot I don't understand, but I take it by faith. Amen. And, and those, are, in, in my eyes, are words of wisdom when we're trying to make sense of everything. Just have faith. Don't try to make sense of it, right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Um, so let's jump in to Romans chapter 5, we'll read from verses 1 through 11. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone might, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than Having not been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, we were, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more have you been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. So, Paul starts chapter 5 with one word, therefore, which means for that reason. Okay, so in order to, to know what he's talking about, 
let's go back to the previous chapter and read the last, the last verse of Romans 4, verse 25. And Paul says, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. For that reason, right, therefore, it says here, Having been justified by faith, we have, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So there's something to say about a, about, about a soul or, or a spirit of a person who's not at peace with God, right? Why would not a person be at peace with God? Well, there's a couple of reasons how I see it, and one is living in sin, okay? This, this could be for the non-believer and the backslidden believer, the backslidden Christian, okay? You see, we weren't created for this, okay? For the way things are. So when we go against or live contrary to, 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 what, to the way we, we were created and the purpose that we were created for, it does something to us. Right? It creates this inner turmoil, right? There's this wrestling that's going on within, and it causes us to, to, to be what? Angry, hurtful, hateful, depressed, just to name a few. Because what's happening is we're basically at war with God, okay? But the good news is we can have peace with God, and that peace can be found through our Lord Jesus Christ, believing in him and, and what he did, the work he did on the cross, right? With all this craziness going on, People don't have peace with God, and that's why it's so important for them to hear this good news, right? And be, or be reminded of the good news, right? That they can have peace with God through Jesus Christ. See, the enemy knows this, right? So he, he's going to continue to do everything he can to keep people in this state that they're in. Just look around the world right now. It seems like everyone's going crazy. That's right where the enemy wants everyone, right? The state that they're in mentally, physically, emotionally, and most importantly, spiritually. Okay, keeping people thinking a certain way, acting a certain way, feeling a certain way, it's going to render them spiritually dead. Okay, and then what's the result? There's no peace with God. All right, so another reason for not having peace with God, and this is for the believer, is being reminded of our sin, being reminded of our past. The enemy is going to continue and continue and continue to be all up in our ear, right, He's just reminding us of our past lives, okay? He wants to feel guilty. He wants us to beat ourselves up. That's his goal for the believer, get to just beat the believer down. Because when we do that, if we give into that, we won't have, we won't have peace with God. You're always going to have that, in that, inner, that inner turmoil, right? But God tells us to move forward, okay? He tells us to move forward and don't look back. Because looking back can destroy us. Okay, just look at Lot's wife. In Genesis nineteen twenty six, but his wife looked behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. So what what was going on there? So Lot and his wife and his family, they were specifically told to flee, right? They were told to flee and not look back because God was about to pour out His wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah. So they were given a warning. But what happened? She looked back. She turned to a pillar of salt. Possibly because she looked back, possibly because she was longing for that past life, right? Again, we need to look forward, not back. The enemy wants us looking back because he knows just how destructive the past is. And he knows just how great what lies ahead is. And he wants to keep us from that. What Paul is telling us here is that there are benefits. There are benefits to being justified by faith. Okay, we have been found guilty before God because of our sin. All right? We're guilty, but we've been let off. Been let off with a warning, so to speak. It's like a judge who, who, who will look at the criminal or, or a person who was born into his court that had a charge brought against him, and he looks at that, at that person and, and he says, you know what? I'm going to let you off with a warning. But don't ever let me see you back in my courtroom again. As long as that person doesn't commit another crime or doesn't do anything wrong, they're good. They'll have peace. They'll be all right. It's the same with us. It's the same with us. Don't go back. Don't listen to the enemy, right? Don't look back because all these things are going to do is just bring wrath upon you. That's what's going to happen. And again, you're going to have no peace with God. 
So one benefit of being justified by faith is having peace with God. Okay, in this world, the Christian will never have peace with the world. So I think that's where a lot of Christians struggle, with, right? We, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a battle every day, right? It's because we're living contrary to the world. So there's always going to be a battle for us, always. But like I said before, I said this before, I'd rather be in a battle with the devil and in a battle with the world than at war with God. That's where I'd rather be because the results are eternal. Okay? The sooner we realize this, that it's a spiritual battle, not a physical one, the better, the better we'll be. Because we can find ourselves caught up, caught up in everything that's going on in the, in the world around us, right? Finding it almost easier just to go back and be at war with God because that's, that's what we know. That's, what, that's where we were most comfortable at one point, right? So the world is going it's, it's gonna to come, come at you, okay? It's going to be all up in your face, right? We see that, right? If you don't agree with it, they're going to be all up in your face, trying to get you to submit, attacking you, right? That's what's going to happen. But God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. You see, when we have that inner turmoil, that wrestling that's going on, that's us wrestling with conviction, right? We're wrestling with conviction. We've been convicted by the Holy Spirit. And God lets us wrestle with it for as long as it takes. He's not going to force us to submit. He's going to leave us to it, and he's going to let us be. Because his conviction comes from a word, a simple word, his word, right? And we're reminded of that word by the Holy Spirit, okay? So we just need to realize what type of battle we're in. Now, the second benefit of, of, of this faith that, that Paul speaks of, it says here in verse 2, through whom, that's Jesus, Christ, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, grace. We hear about it all the time. Right? But what is it? Simply put, it's God's favor towards us. It's undeserved. It's greater than our sin and freely given. Freely given to all who believe. For by faith you have been saved through for, for by faith you have been saved through faith and not and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. See, the Christian begins in grace, continues in grace, and ends in grace. It says here we find ourselves standing, right? That's a, there's a word, right? It's always these one words, standing. It means what? Established. It means rooted, upright in this grace. And it's through Jesus Christ that we have access to this grace. Not through any other religious figure, not through any other work like church attendance, tithing, or keeping the law, right? There's no peace with God if it's, if it's by works because if it's by works, then it's pretty much about us, right? It's, it's through Christ and Christ alone. Faith in him and what he did on the cross. See, it, it's been said that when he went to the cross, his arms were stretched out. And one hand was holding God's, the other hand was holding uh, ours. And he brought us together. Okay? He is the only way. Jesus Christ is the only way. There's no other access to God than Jesus Christ. And having access to God through Jesus, having access to his grace, will give us peace with God. Ephesians 2.18 says, For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Both Jew and Gentile, saved by the same gospel, both have access, right? The same access to the Father. Ephesians 3.12 says, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. So here again, both Jew and Gentile, both have this boldness, the same boldness, the same access, with confidence. That is a word, with confidence. But how? Through faith in him, through faith in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So here, we're told, come boldly. Be confident, not arrogant. Be confident. The enemy wants to discourage us from, from approaching Jesus, right? He, he, we, we, we find ourselves, though, standing in this grace. So let us approach him, approach him boldly in our time of need. So that what? So that we may obtain mercy and grace. And what is the result of this? Of having peace with God and, and, and standing in grace? He says it right here, that we can rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 
Now, if we, again, if we go back to works and base our justification on that, then we can't rejoice in hope of the glory of God. All the rejoicing will be in us. Right? All the glory will go to us. And we all know there's no benefit to that. There's no benefit at all. To hope is to be certain. Certain in the glory of God. That brings us to verses 3 and 4. It says, and not only that, and this, this is where the title of, of uh, the message tonight is, but wait, there's more. Okay? So not, and not only that, it says here in verse 3, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. So it's like an infomercial, right? But wait, there's more. And so Paul does, and not only that, right? And you're like, wait, wait, what? You might say, what, there's more? There's, and you're like, yeah, he's like, yeah, there's more. There's more good news, okay? You can say, I was good with the whole faith thing, right? I was, I was good with all that, you know, justification, the faith, I'm good, but you're telling me there's, there's more than this? And he's like, oh, yeah, there's more, okay? But here's the tough one. How can we glory in tribulations? That's the question. How can we glory in tribulations? And coming from Paul, who knows about tribulations all too well, how can he say this? I, 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 I asked my I said, I said what, did he take one too many beatings? I don't know, what, is he going crazy? And he tells us the glory in tribulations? Because tribulations, they're not minor afflictions. These are, these are real serious issues, tribulations. Okay? So the question again, how can we glory in tribulations? And here it is right here, this one word. Again, there's always that one word, knowing. Knowing. You take that word out, and all you have is Paul telling you what your tribulations produce. Right? And then your response might go something like, hey, what are you talking? How do you know? You know? How do you know that what I'm going through, you know, what it's going to produce and how I'm going to handle You don't know because not everybody handles problems the same. Right? But this word, knowing, it makes you realize something. It makes you realize that this knowing is by experience. And Paul, that's what Paul is tapping into. When he says knowing, to know something is to be sure, but not in the sense of an intellectual knowledge, okay? That's what we need to understand. It's a knowledge from experience. The Old Testament word is yada, and it's used about 950 times in the Old Testament. Do you think God's not trying to tell us something, right? When, he, when God says, you don't know me, we read that earlier in Romans, he says, you don't know me. He means you haven't experienced me. You haven't built a relationship with me. He wants us to know him. He wants us to experience. Because when we experience, we know for sure. Okay? The New Testament word is gnosko. And it means to know, especially through personal experience. So Paul is saying we know for sure that tribulations produce perseverance. Okay, so at times we can face our tribulations with a bit of uncertainty. Right? That can happen at times. But Paul reminds us that we can know. And know for sure. And again, it makes us think, I've been going through this. Whatever, whatever, you, whatever you're dealing with, whatever your tribulation is, I've been going through this. But wait, it's been a month, it's been a year, it's been two years, whatever, whatever, however long it's been, maybe longer. And you say, wow, I've gotten through it. I've gotten through it to, to this point. Now I know I can handle it. Amen. It's like a runner, right? My wife, Victoria, she's a runner. She ran a New York City Marathon. She won. Uh, <laughs> she ran a New York City Marathon. She ran some 5Ks. And the, and the training can be brutal. It can be brutal. But the perseverance or the endurance that it produces, it gives them what they need to finish the race. Okay, do they give up when the training gets tough or when they're in the race and it's more than they, than they you know, um, expected? No, they keep going, Right? Because they know that they have the perseverance or the endurance to finish. It's like that the mentality. It's like, I came this far, I'm not giving up. And knowing pushes us. It pushes us to continue and to finish. And the question becomes, do we allow our tribulations to produce perseverance? Or do we give up so easily? Right? If we give up, there'll be no glory. Right? There's no glory in that. See, tribulations help us to grow spiritually if we allow them, okay? And that's where hope comes in, okay? Hoping in what's to come. And we'll take, we'll take a, a look at, at hope in, in a bit, right? So 
Everyone faces tribulations, right? But not everybody handles them the same. Okay, for the Christian, we could be confident that our tribulations will produce something, right? Something good in our lives. But for the non-believer, tribulations are just problems. And they get handled differently. See, for the most part, Christians have, or, or at least should have, patience in tribulations, right? Knowing that something good will come, come of them. Something good is going to come out of this. Genesis 50, 20 says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. So here's Joseph, right? His brothers, right? You know the story. His brothers were angry with him. They were jealous. They threw him in a pit, right? Oh, because he had these dreams, right? He's letting his father know about these dreams. His brother's like, uh-uh. We're not having any of that. Threw him right in the pit. Sold him into slavery, right? His father believed he was dead. All that time passed. He stayed in Egypt, right? He found favor there. Right? He found favor there. And, he, and it was used to bring about good. And he even blessed his brothers when, when they met up again. He blessed them. There, you know, you see there in verse 19 of Genesis 50, he says, Do not be afraid, for I am in the place of God. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So you see, Joseph could have sought vengeance, right? He could have, but he found himself in the goodness of God, right? And he, and he allowed God to use him where he was. So the non-believer will probably get fed up in their tribulation, handle the tribulation a little differently, right, from an emotional standpoint. And that comes from the flesh. And we all know nothing good comes of that. Nothing good comes from the flesh. Now, there's a reason for perseverance, for endurance, Matthew 24, 13, Jesus said, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. There's a reason for it. There's a reason to stay in the fight, stay in the battle, right? Endure, endure to the end. Chuck Smith says, in every trial is an opportunity for God to manifest himself. This brings us to verse 4, where Paul says, now perseverance produces character. Okay. So when we endure and, and when we're patient in times of trouble, waiting for God to act, it builds character. Our response to tribulation builds character. And our character will say a lot about how we respond. Matter of fact, being patient in tribulations allows us to experience God's character, right? God's faithfulness, his love, his compassion, his care. And when we wait on him during these times, we become more like him during these times. We learn how to respond. Okay, that's how our character gets built. Now, if we respond like the non-believer, we'll develop the character of a non-believer. Okay, and it's going to show. Hey, people are watching, right? They're watching us. Their eyes are on us. They're waiting to see how we respond. And they'll sit there and they'll say, wow, wow, he or, he or she, they, they, they've been going through this this whole time. Look, look how long they've been dealing with this issue, perseverance, right? Look how, they, look how they've handled it, character, right? There's something about them, right? There's something, what is it? I, I, I want that. It's hope, okay? And we'll talk about, again, we'll talk about hope in a minute. But if we respond the opposite way, well, then their response is going to be different, right? It's going to be, you see, because always always, somebody's always looking to point to forget the Christian. You see, they call themselves a Christian. Look, look, how they, look how they're responding. Look how they're reacting so harshly, so quickly, right? They're getting crazy, right? There goes your perseverance, your character, and your hope. Gone. Gone. And you're telling them you have no hope by the way you respond in certain situations. Now, again, yeah, I'm not trying to make it seem like the Christian, this is how we have to be. We, we can't. We have to be like robots. No. Because we can, we can, you know, get emotional at times. Yeah. But we have to remember, like the song said, he's still on his throne. And he's in control. Hebrews 6, 19 says, This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. So an anchor. Anchor does what? It keeps us still. It keeps us firm. You, you rarely, if ever, 
need an anchor in calm seas, right? Unless you want to hunker down there for a while and, you know, not drift off, right? Unless you, like, if you're cool where you are, they want to hang out, look at the stars, drop an anchor. But the anchor is needed more in rough seas. It's needed more in a storm, right? The rougher, the greater the need for an anchor. This is what hope is. Hope is an anchor when times get tough. It helps to make sure we don't, we don't get overtaken by the storm, by the rough seas, and, and it keeps us firm and unwavering. So our hope will keep us steady in the storm. Right? Without an anchor, we'll be tossed to and fro, here and there, possibly even backwards, right? And then when the storm passes, we have to work all over again to get where we were. But if you drop that anchor, right? You drop that anchor when, when the storm passes, you just keep moving forward. That's progress, right? It says there, sure and steadfast. This means certain, confident, right? Steadfast, the definition is resolutely or dutifully, dutifully firm and unwavering. And this hope sees us into the presence of God. Jesus Christ, being our high priest, has entered into the presence of God before us so we may follow him. He wants us to be where he is. John 17, 24, Jesus, Jesus prayed, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. Do we see the pattern here? It starts with faith in Jesus. And he tells us, John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace, in the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So here he tells us, we're going to face tribulations. It's inevitable. It's going to happen, right? But we need not fear because he overcame the world. And how do we overcome? Perseverance. Perseverance builds character. And all this gives us hope. Now, Romans 5.5 5 says, now hope. Now we're going to get into hope here. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So Paul's telling us that we're not going to be disappointed at the result of our tribulations. Okay, because out of it will come hope. Hope in God, hope in Jesus, hope what lies ahead. And that type of hope will never disappoint. That's what Paul is telling us. It will never let us down. And why? Because God has demonstrated he has demonstrated, he has shown us what his plans are, what he plans to do in us, and this is shown through his love for us, which is poured out in us by the Holy Spirit, as it says here. So as believers, we should, to some degree, know or experience the love of God. Okay, Paul calls us to not only have the right thoughts about God, but also the right experience with him. Through our experience with him, we could be sure of his love. And that does what? It gives us hope. And here it says hope does not disappoint because it comes from experiencing the goodness of God in our tribulations. The goodness of God comes from his love, which, love for us, which now, hear this, is poured out. See, God's love doesn't come in bits and pieces. Right? It doesn't come in little, in little trickles and small amounts. It's poured out in our hearts now, I don't believe we can handle the, the full, the love of God in full measure. I believe we cannot handle it. I think it'll crush us, actually. But he will give us as much as we can handle at once. I just imagine what the, what the full measure, right, of his, of his love is like. Again, it, it, it would crush us. And this love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So God's love is communicated to us through the Holy Spirit. That's why when people claim to not feel or know the love of God, it's because they don't have the Holy Spirit. They're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So God is in us in the form of the Holy Spirit. God has given himself to us to dwell in us, but not every Christian walks in the Spirit. Okay, unfortunately, Romans 8, 4, and 5 says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. 
For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who love according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. See, we can be Christians and still be of the flesh, right? Not every Christian is living in the fullness of the spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, Paul says, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. Dissipation is separation. Okay, it's dispersion. So it's a wasting away. And those who are given in to drunkenness, Paul says, they're not living in the fullness of the spirit. Proverbs 21 says, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. And whoever is led astray, astray by, it, it, by it is not wise. Excuse me. So living this way will definitely separate, separate us from God. Okay? Be filled with the Holy Spirit, Paul is telling us. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, here's a few sobering verses. No pun intended. Uh, verses 6 through 8. Paul says, For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we were still without strength. I think about this and I, and I ask, what does it mean, still without strength? Well, to put it plainly, we're weak. We're weak. And we're weak because of sin. Oh, the arrogance of man. Man always thinking he's so strong, right? And everything that we do. You know when I became strong? When I admitted I was weak. Hey, okay, when I admitted that I was weak and I said, God, I need you. I can't do this without you. Help me. That's when I became strong. It's not, it's not a physical strength, right? Sin has made us weak, guys, physically, mentally, emotionally, and most importantly, spiritually. We only look at the physical. The human man, the man will only look at the physical to the point where we're in the gym, we're trying to push up 500 LBs, right? We're flexing in the mirror. It's all why so that we could look good to other people, right? That's what we make it about. If I can feel strong and look strong, I'm good. We'll get that respect from others and we'll feel so confident, right? Again, it's all about how others see us and what they think. But that's why when we come to that place and we realize it's not about the physical. This is about the spiritual. And it's at that point we'll see just how weak we are. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. God, help me. I need you. I cannot do this without you. Without God, we are weak. Without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we cannot handle what's going on in this world. Okay? And here we see how great God is. Here is God's love in due time. It says there, in due time. That means there was a set time. There was an appointed time, the time for Christ to die, okay? It's an estimated or, or expected time for something to happen. And he died for who? The ungodly, the sinner, the weak. That's everybody, right? But God's timing is perfect. His timing is perfect. Galatians 4.4 4 says, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son. It says there in, in, in Galatians 4.4. 4. Jesus Christ came at the right time according to God's plan. God's plan is laid out perfectly, and everything he sets forth, anything he makes happen, whether we think it's too late or too soon, it's at the perfect time. So trust it. Accept it. Daniel 9, 24 to 26, Daniel prophesied, his 70 weeks are determined for your people and for, your, for you, for your holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. 
So Daniel prophesied, and his prophecy was being fulfilled. Again, God's timing is perfect. He's never late. He's never early. He's always right on time. It says there, Christ died for. In verse 6, Christ died for. That means instead of. That word for. That means instead of. The Greek word is hooper. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. So Jesus Christ was our substitute. Right? The propitiation for our sins at the cross. He was our substitute. The cross that was meant for us. He went there for us. Now Paul here in verse 7 shows us just who we are. Okay? He says here, rarely... If ever would a man die for man is what he's saying in verse 7. Whether righteous or good, it doesn't matter. Okay, scarcely for a righteous man, he says, and perhaps for a good man one would dare, he says. So take note. He's saying if man would die for man, it would be for a righteous man or a good man. He makes no mention of an ungodly man there. Okay? So it's possible, but unlikely. And here in verse 8, he shows us just who God is. Right? But God, there's, a, there's, there's those two words, but God. That right there separates God from man. This is who we are. This is who God is. It, it, sa it says, again, it says man is like this, but God is like this. He demonstrates his own love. That, that's, that means it, it, it shows usually by an action, Okay. His own love, he demonstrated, he showed us it, and, and that action was Jesus Christ going to the cross. He says that we, while we were still sinners, now this is everyone. Again, Christ died for us, and it's not the act of Christ dying, so to speak. It's not, it's not the act, it's who he died for. John 3, 16, 17, we all know this one. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his, his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This one act was proof of God's love. Okay? And God was reconciling himself, reconciling the world to himself. 2 Corinthians 5.19, Paul says, that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That brings us to Romans, the, the last few verses here in, uh, that we'll be reading tonight, verses 9 through 11. And Paul says, much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, for if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more have you been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we, we have now received the reconciliation. Why couldn't you leave your glasses up here? <laughs> so since we are justified by the work of Jesus Christ, the shedding of his blood, we shall be saved from wrath, through him. What wrath? The wrath of God. The wrath of God that Paul spoke of in, in Romans 1.18. He said, I don't think you have it, Thorne. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And we are saved from this wrath because he, that's Jesus, took the wrath, right, for us. He took the wrath for us. He is our substitute, the propitiation for our sins. Reconciliation is the process of two parties coming to peace after a period of estrangement or enmity. That's us. That describes us right there. We were separated from God. And we were at enmity with him. Okay? And through Jesus and the giving of his life, we were reconciled to God and our lives saved. But wait, there's more. Okay? I love this. Paul does a great job with this. I love it. And because of this one selfless act, we cannot rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
through whom we now have received reconciliation, right? If that doesn't strengthen our hope, increase our hope, then I don't know what will. See, a world without, without trust in God, faith in Jesus Christ, is a world without hope. All they see is a fiery furnace or a pit in the ground. That's all they see. We see heaven. We see the glory of God. So hold on to hope. Stand firm, steadfast, endure to the end. Don't give up. Remember the goal. Finish the race. Right? Enter into the glory of God and hear those beautiful words we all want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. Father God, we, we thank you for this evening, Lord God. We thank you for your word, Lord. And I just pray that every one of us, Lord, will leave here tonight different than when we came in. Maybe with an increase in, in, in the hope that we have in you, Lord God. Maybe we, maybe we be reminded of that every day, Lord. That you are on your throne, that you are in control, Lord God. And again, we just thank you for this word. So go before us tonight, Lord God. Get us home. Get us all home safely, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.